Hi there, and welcome to this video where I'm going to teach you all about the LuxVerb Reverb effect in FL Studio. This video is actually a section taken from my complete FL Studio course. So, after watching this video, if you want to learn about even more functions and features of FL Studio, then be sure to check out my complete course. The link to this course is in the description below. Okay, so let's get started with this video. Now let's talk about the LuxVerb Reverb effect, which is available in FL Studio 21. Just be aware though that this plugin is only available in the All Plugins edition of FL Studio 21. So if you've got the Signature, Producer or Fruity edition of FL Studio, then you won't have this reverb effect, so just bear that in mind. This isn't just a regular reverb plugin though. LuxVerb also offers many sound design possibilities, which I'll be covering in this section. Of course, it has all the regular controls that a reverb effect will have, such as decay time, pre-delay, size, and high and low cut filters, which I'll be covering in detail too in this section. There are also some more advanced features of this reverb, which allows you to create some really interesting sound design possibilities, which again, I'll be covering in this section. So in the next two videos, I'll show you some of the presets that come with this reverb, and then I'll dive deep into all of the controls on this effect. Also, feel free to follow along with me in this section, or you can use your own musical examples if you wish. I'm actually going to demonstrate the first part of this section on the snare drum, and it is very common to add reverb to a snare. Then later on, I'll show you reverb on a string sound and a piano sound. So I'm going to add a snare drum on beats two and beats four in the channel rack. And this is getting sent to channel four in the mixer. So for this, I will be using the 808 snare. If you want to load this exact sample, just head over to the library and type in 808 snare, and click and drag this over to the channel rack. And if we look at the mixer here, on channel four, I have LuxVerb loaded. So you can load LuxVerb by clicking on an empty slot in the effect slot area here. And then under new, it says LuxVerb. If you're using a later version of FL Studio, then this may have been moved to the delay reverb section, but from the date of recording this video, it's in the new section. Okay, so we're now ready to get started. So join me in the next video, where we're going to look at some of the preset sounds that come with this effect. Okay, so the first thing I want to mention is the presets for this reverb. In this section, I will be showing you how to use the reverb from this default preset sound, but presets are a great way to get a sound to build from or to get inspiration for a sound. Don't worry, I will soon be showing you how to use this reverb from scratch, but let's have a quick look at some of these presets now so we can hear how versatile this reverb is and also how many different types of reverb this plugin can create. So we can click on this preset button up here in the top right of the plugin, and this will open up the preset list, or we can scroll through the presets with the left and right arrow buttons here. So let's open up the drop down list and let's first choose a hall. So these presets here will emulate the sound of reverb from a hall. So it's been designed to sound like the sound has been placed in a hall or concert hall, which are typically large spaces that have reflective surfaces. So this is trying to emulate a real life space. As a hall is very large, these reverbs will have a large decay, which means it will take quite a while for the reverb sound to fade to silence. So this might be good for adding space to instruments such as pads and string samples. You may wish to add hall reverb to orchestral instruments or ballad vocals too, because you may wish to emulate these instruments playing in a large concert hall. Because you're emulating the reverb from a large hall, it can give your audio a lush or thick sound. However, if you overuse hall reverbs, then it can muddy up your mix, so just bear that in mind. Okay, so for this example, let's try this one here called Bright Hall. Before I play this back though, I'm just going to decrease the tempo to 80 beats per minute. So I'm going to right click on the tempo here and choose 80 BPM. And now let's play back our snare. So you can hear there, it's emulating a bright hall. Okay, let's now choose another one. So let's go back to the drop down list and let's choose another hall reverb. Let's choose this one, huge echoey hall. And you should be able to hear that this will emulate a very large hall. As you could hear there, it was emulating a very large echoey hall. Let's now have a quick look at some room reverbs. This will sound more like the reverb that we hear in a normal day to day world, as it'll be emulating smaller sized acoustic spaces. So these room reverbs are trying to emulate a real life space. Again, these are designed to sound like the sound has been placed in a room. Using a room reverb can add a bit of liveliness to the track and can sound very natural. So these are useful to use with guitars, vocals, pianos and drums for example, but you can pretty much use room reverb on any instrument. 
So Room Reverb allows you to add space in the mix, but not too much that you'd be muddying up the mix. Okay, so let's choose this one, Live Drum Room. So you should be able to hear that this emulates a much smaller room than the previous hall presets. Let's choose a larger one now. Let's choose this one called Large Wood Room. You should be able to hear that this room will sound bigger. Okay, now let's talk about plate reverbs, and these are often used on vocals and snares. So, a plate reverb doesn't emulate a real-world space, like what hall and room reverbs do. A plate reverb is actually one of the earliest types of artificial reverb. Plate reverb is created by using a large metal plate, which is suspended by strings inside a metal frame. Then the audio is fed into the plate, and the vibrations from the plate are picked up by microphones. Plate reverb gives you a natural and bright sounding reverb, with a slight compressed sound. As I said, these types of reverbs are often used with snare drums and vocals, but plate reverb can be applied to any audio signal. And in Luxverb, we can emulate plate reverbs. So let's hear some of these plate reverbs now with this snare. Let's choose this one, Bright Drum Plate. I think that sounds nice. It gives a nice natural and bright sound. Let's choose another one. Let's choose this one here called Dark Plate which should sound darker than the previous bright drum plate reverb. Okay, so there are some of the standard reverb presets. Next, we're going to look at some more unusual presets. Okay, so let's quickly look at some more presets before we dive deep into this plugin. Let's have a look at some more unusual reverb presets. Most reverb plugins might have room, hall, plate, and maybe spring presets. But here we have pitch shift and envelope presets. So let's have a quick look at some of these. Let's first have a listen to some of these envelope presets. So the envelope section in this reverb allows us to almost modulate the decay and wet signal of the reverb to create a gated type of reverb. A gated type of reverb was popular with 80s music and also synth wave or retro wave music too. With this effect, the reverb can create a gated sound so the reverb can open or close or stop. Let me show you this now. Let's try this one, gated fast and abrupt. So we could hear the snare play, and then the reverb sound seemed to suddenly stop. So if I drag down the dry signal, and just leave the wet reverberated signal, if I play this back now, you should be able to hear the reverb sound die out suddenly, much more sudden than how a normal reverb would die out. Let's just put this back to default. We can go back to default by alt clicking on Windows or option clicking on Mac. Okay, let's now hear another envelope preset. Let's hear this one called Gated, Bright and Boomy. Again, we can hear this gated effect where the reverb effect is gated and sounds like it dies out suddenly. We can also see some of the envelopes here in the envelope graph which I'll be talking about later on. We do also have some other envelope presets here that you can explore, but for now, let's check out some of the pitch shift presets. In this reverb, we can pitch shift the reverb feedback, which can create some interesting sound design effects. Let's try this one here, bottomless pit fifth down. So let's hear this back. We can see here in the feedback section, it's pitched down seven semitones or one fifth. If I turn off the feedback section here and play it back, you'll notice we can't hear the pitch shifting effect. Okay, let's now try another preset. Let's try this one, shimmer fifth up lush bright. This time it will pitch shift the feedback up a fifth or seven semitones. This does have a long decay time, so if I decrease this via this decay dial over here, you'll notice it will change the sound of the reverb a lot. So I do recommend testing out some of these presets, 
and then adjusting some of the dials and faders to see how it changes the sound. Next, I'll be going into detail for each section of this reverb effect. Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at the input section for this Luxverb reverb effect. Before we get started though, let's just set this back to the default preset. And we can do this by clicking on the preset drop down list here, and then clicking on default at the top. On the left of this plugin, we have the input gain for the reverb. This allows us to adjust the input level that we're sending to the reverb effect. This just affects the wet sound, so the reverb sound, and not the dry, unreverberated original sound. Let me just show you now. So if I increase this all the way to the top, you'll hear that the reverb is much louder. And if I go to the output and decrease the dry signal, you'll notice we can only hear the reverb sound. Now when I adjust the input slider, you can hear that the dry signal hasn't changed, it's just affected the wet signal. So this input wet gain slider won't affect the dry signal, just the wet signal. And when I decrease this, you'll notice the reverb sound is a lot quieter. Let me put the input wet gain back to default by alt clicking on Windows or option clicking on Mac. And I'll also put the dry dial back to default in the output section. Okay, so now let's have a look at high cut and low cut. So high cut will attenuate or reduce high frequencies that will be sent into the reverb effect. We can set this in Hertz and it will attenuate or reduce from where we select here. So for example, if I move this to around 10,000 Hertz, then it will attenuate the frequencies of the reverb that are above 10,000 Hertz. Let's now hear this back. Let's just put the dry signal all the way down so we can just hear the reverb, so it's a bit easier to hear these changes. Let's drag this even further down. Let's change this to around 5000 Hertz. And you should notice there that it's attenuated a lot of these high frequencies for the reverb. If I drag this all the way up to 20,000 Hertz, which is around the highest limit of human hearing, then you should be able to notice we can hear a lot more of the high frequencies in the reverb. But now if I drag this down to say 4000 Hertz, then we won't be able to hear the high end of the reverb frequencies. Let's put this back to the default, which is 15,000 Hertz. Again, we can go back to default by alt clicking on Windows or option clicking on Mac. The low cut does the same, but it attenuates the low frequencies. By default, it's on 20 Hertz, which is around the lowest humans can hear, so we will hear all of the lower frequencies of this reverb. But if we move this all the way up to 5000 Hertz, then you'll notice that we can only hear the higher frequencies of the reverb. This might be a bit too extreme, but it is useful to use extreme settings in the plugin just so you can hear exactly what it does, and then you can dial it back to something a bit more usable. But for this, let's dial it back to around 600, and this should be a bit more usable. Let's hear this now. I'd personally say that low cut is a bit more useful than high cut, as it can be useful to cut some of the low frequencies going into the reverb. That's because these low frequencies of the reverb can get a little messy and can muddy up the mix a bit. Okay, so that's the input section. Next, we're going to look at the reverb section, which you should be familiar with if you've used other reverb effects before. Remember, this is just one section taken from our complete FL Studio course. If you want to learn even more functions and features of FL Studio, then be sure to check out our complete course. You can access this course via the link in the description below. Okay, so let's get back to the video. Okay, so now let's have a look at the reverb section. You should be familiar with a lot of these controls if you've used a reverb effect before, as this section is quite standard, but I'll still go over these settings just in case you're new to using reverb or as a refresher. So in this part one video, I'll be looking at decay, brightness, size, diffusion, and character. Then after in the part two video, I'll look at pre-delay, mod amp, and mod frequency. Then in part three, I'll look at freeze and high quality. And the freeze settings here are quite unique, and as I said, I'll be covering this in part three. Before we get started though, let's set this back to the default preset. So let's go over to the preset dropdown list and click on default. So the first thing you'll probably notice is this large decay dial over here. This allows us to choose the decay time. 
the decay affects the length of the reverb tail or how long the reverb goes for. This is the time it takes for the reverb sound to completely die out or fade out. You can see here it's set at 5.222 seconds, which means it takes just over 5 seconds for the reverb tail to decay or fade out to 0 dB. Let's hear a snare hit now with this default decay setting. And we can also see the decay here in this envelope graph. We also have a maximum of 20 seconds, which will give us a very long reverb tail. Let's hear this back now. Again, we can see the decay in this envelope graph. Okay, let's choose a different musical example. I'm going to add a string sound now. A longer decay time may be useful for strings or synth sound, so let's add this now. So I'm going to choose a string sample from the browser. If you have the same sample as me, feel free to use this, or use your own sample. So I'm going to go down to the browser, and type in strings. I'm going to choose this one here, VRZ, full strings vibrato 10. I think this one will work, but as I said, you don't have to use the exact sample as me. If you're following along, any kind of string or pad sound will be fine for this example. So now I'm going to click and drag this to a new channel in the channel rack. And now let's choose an empty channel in the mixer. For this, I'm going to choose channel 5. Now let's make sure channel 5 is selected, and then click on a blank effect slot on the right of the mixer here, and then choose LuxVerb. And now let's close the previous LuxVerb, so we just have this new one. Let's hit this back now, I'm just going to play a few keys on my MIDI keyboard. OK, I'm going to play this back again, and this time I'll adjust the decay time during playback. So I believe adding some decay time to the string part does sound quite good. Of course, depending on the part and the song, and also the effect you're going for, you may wish to have a longer or shorter decay time. For a more staccato or stabbing string sound, you may wish to have a shorter decay time. And for more legato or held notes, you may wish to have a longer decay time. If I set this back to default by alt clicking on Windows or option clicking on Mac, it will go to 7 seconds. And this means it will take 7 seconds for the reverb tail to fade to silence after the note has been triggered. So I'm going to let go of the note now. And that was around 7 seconds for the sound to completely die out. OK, so now let's have a look at the next control which is the brightness dial. This allows us to adjust the presence in the reverb tail. So you notice when I increase this dial, the reverb will sound brighter. Let's turn down the decay, and I'm also going to put the dry dial all the way down, just so we can hear the reverb so it's a bit easier to hear. Let me adjust the brightness dial again, and with this control, higher amounts should sound brighter. If we put the brightness setting all the way down, we can hear that the reverb tail sounds much duller. With this setting, it's dampening the high frequencies of the reverb. So when the brightness is down, the room the reverb is emulating will sound more absorbent. Then when we increase the brightness, the room will sound more reflective, so maybe a room of hard surfaces that has a lot of reflections. Let's now put this back to default, and move on to the next control, which is size. Size will adjust the artificial room size. With this, we can emulate a large or smaller sized room. For example, if we go to some of these presets here, and now let's choose a preset that emulates a smaller space, such as this one here, small vocal room. Here you can see the size is set to 10. Now let's choose a slightly larger room, for example, large drum room. You can see the size is at 16. Now let's choose a larger room than this. Let's choose this preset called Medium Room. 
and you can see the size is at 25. So for the size, around 10 to 50 will emulate a room or hall space. Now let's choose one that will emulate a very large space. Let's choose huge echoey hall, and you can see here the room size is at 65. So if you have the size amount above 50, then it will be quite extreme. So maybe a huge hall sound will be above 50. Okay, let's now choose one of these plate presets. Let's choose this one here called medium plate. And you can see here the size is six. So a smaller size setting from around one to 10 will give us a plate or electromechanical type of reverb. However, let's set this back to the default preset. And let's now have a look at the next setting, which is diffusion. So if we increase the diffusion dial here, then it will emulate acoustic diffusers. It's like adding more objects in the room to break up the regularity of the echoes in the room. So the sound will bounce off these objects which will diffuse the sound. This setting is quite hard to hear with a string sample, so let's now go back to the snare sample. So we can see here the snare is on channel 4. So let's open up Luxverb for the snare. Again, let's put this back to default. And now let's play this back and adjust this diffusion dial. Before I do this though, I'm just going to put the dry setting all the way down so we can hear this reverb a bit clearer. With high amounts of this diffusion control, it will create a smoother sounding reverb because we're breaking up the consistency of the echoes by adding acoustic diffusers in an emulated room or space. So it'll smooth out the initial echoes of the reverb when you increase this diffusion dial here. Let's just drag this down a bit and look at the next control, which is character. With this, we can choose the structure of the echoes for the reverb response. So basically, this allows us to change the character of the reverb tail. If we put this to the midpoint of 0.5, this will give us a smooth and diffuse reverb tail. When we increase this though, we can hear the character a little more. With this higher setting, we can hear that the echoes create a kind of pulsing delay effect. Then with lower values, it will sound less smooth and a bit rougher or grittier. We can also hear this pulsing delay effect a lot clearer when we increase the size amount. With high amounts as well, you may also see ripples in the spectrum sound when we increase the character. Let's now put size back to default. I'd normally leave the character around 0.5 but you can always experiment with this if you want a grittier character by using lower values or having a pulsing delay effect by using higher values. Okay, so that's the end of this part one video. Next, we continue looking at the reverb section. Okay, so let's continue looking at the reverb section. So in this video, I'll be showing you the pre-delay, mod amp, and mod frequency dials. Before we get started though, let's set this back to the default preset by clicking on the preset drop-down list down here and going to default. Okay, so now let's have a look at pre-delay. Pre-delay is the amount of time it takes from the input signal until we hear the delay. So it's basically the time it takes for the reverb to make a sound after the input signal. This is measured in milliseconds, but we can also sync this to our tempo project by clicking this T button down here. So imagine you're in a room and you make a sound. You will hear the reverb bouncing off the walls and ceilings and any objects in the room and coming back to your ears after you make the sound. So if we have a really long pre-delay, let's put this to the maximum amount of 500 milliseconds or half a second. And now when I play this sample back, you'll notice there's a gap in the graph down here. So there we could see the initial sound and then the reverb tail. Let me show you this again, but this time let's use the tempo based time. This can be useful if you want to sync your reverb's pre-delay with the tempo of your project. And this goes all the way up to 16, which is 16 steps or four beats or a bar. Let me just put this down to eight and turn on the click or metronome. 
and then I'm going to add a snare on beat one, and I'm just going to delete the other snares we have here. So when they play this back, you should notice that we hear the snare sound on beat one, and then we hear the reverb sound on beat three, or after eight steps. The pre-delay amount I'm using right now may be a bit too long, but something like two steps might be a bit more useful. So now after the initial sound, the reverb will enter after two steps or half a beat. So if we have this T button enabled, the pre-delay will be synced to the tempo of your project. And if you deselect this, you will have a free tempo time-based pre-delay in milliseconds. If we alt-click on this, it will set the pre-delay to zero milliseconds, so there will be no pre-delay. I'm also going to turn off the metronome, and let's have a look at the next settings, which are Mod Amp and Mod Freak. This is short for Modulation Amplitude and Modulation Frequency. These can create a chorus type effect. So for this example, let's go back to the string sound. So I'm just going to close this reverb. Let's select the channel for the strings in the mixer and also for the channel rack. And now let's go over to the effects slot and open up Lux Verb here. Again, let's set this back to default by clicking on the preset here and going to default. So the effect we can create with Mod Amp and Mod Freak is actually more noticeable when the character controls are at a maximum of one or a minimum of zero. The effect is also less noticeable when the character setting is at its default of 0.5. Okay, let me show you this now. So I'm going to play this back and adjust Mod Amp and Mod Freak and also adjust the character and you should be able to hear a chorus-like effect. And when I increase this to the maximum of one, or use the minimum of zero, you should hear this chorus type effect, it's more noticeable. Another thing to mention is when you use higher values for the modulation frequency, this causes the modulation to be faster and more obvious to hear. So I'm going to play this chord again, but just adjust the modulation frequency dial. With higher values, you can add a much more eerie or weird sound to the reverb, which can be quite interesting. And let's play this back one more time and adjust the character and the modulation frequency. So if you use high values for this modulation frequency, this can cause the reverb sound to sound quite eerie or weird, which can be quite interesting. Okay, so in this video, we've had a look at pre-delay, mod amp and mod frequency. In the next video, we're going to look at these freeze controls and the high quality control. Okay, so now let's have a look at the reverb freeze modes and the high quality setting for the Luxverb reverb effect. First of all, let's just go back to the default presets. And now let's have a look at the freeze setting. So here we have this slider control and we have three options, normal, freeze and sustain. By default, it's on normal, which is what I was using previously, so there's no change to the sound if it's on normal. Let's now talk about the freeze mode. So this will sustain the reverberated signal as soon as you select freeze. It will also cut the input to the reverb, so if you play any more notes whilst freeze is selected, it won't have the reverb applied to it. Let's hear this now. So I'm going to play a note, and then switch it over to freeze mode. And then let go of the note there. and the reverb will be frozen and will continue to play until we switch it back over to normal mode. So I'm going to play this again, but I'm going to add more notes after, and you'll notice that reverb will not be applied to the new notes. Let's now have a look at the sustain switch. This is the same as the freeze mode, but it won't cut the input to the reverb, so if you have this mode selected, and you play more notes, the new notes will continue to have sustained reverb as well. Let me show you this now. Again, like the freeze mode, if we switch it back to normal, the reverb will fade out. So you could automate this control from normal to either freeze or sustain, if you want a sustained or frozen reverb sound for part of your song. Okay, so now let's have a look at the last thing in this reverb section, that is this HQ button. 
HQ stands for high quality, and if we have this enabled, it will give us more sustained high frequencies, but it will use up more CPU or computer power. So if your computer is struggling, then you may wish to disable this, but if your computer isn't struggling, then I recommend leaving this on. This HQ setting is more noticeable when freeze or sustain modes are being used though. So if HQ is disabled, then higher frequencies will die out over time and you won't be able to hear as many sustained high frequencies. I'll show you this first with HQ enabled. Okay, so now I'm going to play back a high pitched note and switch over to freeze mode. And again, when I change this back to normal, the reverb will die out. So let's hear this again with HQ disabled. So you can hear there that it sounds like it's filtered out some of the high frequencies when HQ was disabled. We also can see the differences on the spectrum. Let's just enable HQ again and play this example back. We can see here it's quite even on the spectrum. And now if we switch off HQ and play this example back again, you'll notice it won't be as even in the spectrum. So we can see here in the spectrum, it is cutting or filtering some of these high frequencies over time. So I do recommend having HQ enabled if your computer isn't struggling. Okay, so that is the reverb section. Next, we're going to look at the feedback section. Okay, so now let's have a look at the feedback section, which is this section over here. By default, it's disabled, but we can turn it on and off with this button over here at the top right of the section. This feedback section actually includes a pitch shifter for the feedback which can sound quite interesting and can create a shimmer effect, which I'll show you soon. So feedback is added to the signal after the inputs, high and low filters, pre-delay and diffusion. We also have some controls just for the feedback. So these feedback settings won't affect the sound of the reverb or the input to the reverb, just the feedback. Let me show you this now on the snare drum as it's quite easy to hear this effect on the snare. So let's select the snare in the mixer and also in the channel rack and open up Luxverb here. Again, let's turn on feedback and have a look at some of these controls. If I play the snare back now, we won't hear the feedback because we will need to increase this gain control to hear the feedback. So let's now increase the gain control and hear this back again. So the feedback there was pitch shift one octave up or plus 12 semitones and we can adjust the pitch shift with this dial here. We don't have to pitch shift this much, we could pitch shift one semitone to give a subtle detune sound. Let me show you now. We can also pitch shift down if we want. Let's just choose minus 12 or one octave lower so we can clearly hear this. Again, we can use a subtler effect. Let's try minus seven, which is down one fifth. This effect might be quite interesting on a piano sound as well. So let me show you this on FL keys. So let's close this reverb now and go over to the plus button in the channel rack and create a new instrument. Let's select FL keys. And I'm just going to send this to a new channel. Let's choose channel six in the mixer. And then make sure we have channel six selected in the mixer and go over to an empty effect slot and choose Luxverb. Now if I play some notes on my MIDI keyboard, it should be a piano sound. Okay, great. Let's now turn on feedback and let's increase the gain and hear this pitch shift feedback with the piano sound. Again, let's try a more subtle effect. Let's try this at plus one. So you can hear that it can sound pretty creepy and uncomfortable when we pitch up one semitone. This might be the sound you're after if you want a more uncomfortable or eerie sound for your part. Again, we have this gain slider so we can add more of the feedback if we wish. Or less of the feedback if we wish. As I said, if this gain slider is all the way down, we won't hear any of the feedback. It 
If we increase the decay, then we can hear it takes longer for the feedback to go to the pitch that we select here in the pitch shift dial. Just for this example, let's put this up 12 semitones so it's easier to hear, and the longer decay time will pitch shift slower. And a shorter decay time will pitch shift faster. One thing to mention is the feedback gain sliders will actually turn red if you're hitting the built-in saturator. So if you see it's going red, you may wish to turn it down a little if you don't want the sound to get distorted. This is also the same for the input wet gain slider too. Just for this example, so you can see the gain sliders turn red, I'll put the wet gain to the maximum and you should see the slider and also the feedback gain slider turn red. This will mean it's hitting the built-in saturator and if this does happen, then I do recommend turning down the gain sliders so you don't get distortion unless that's the effect you desire. Depending on the part, if we have the pitch shift dial set low and we have a high decay time, this may also cause the gain sliders to turn red, so just bear that in mind too. Again, let's put decay back to default. Okay, so now let's have a look at the filter controls we have in the feedback section. So we have high cut and low cut. So the high cut filter will filter the frequency above the frequency that we select here in Hertz. And the low cut filter will filter the feedback below the frequency that we select here in Hertz. This high cut dial here may be useful for filtering out any really high top end frequencies that can sound unpleasant to the ear if you're pitching up with the pitch shifter. So if I play this back now, you'll notice that the feedback will filter out any frequencies that's above what I select here. So with high amounts, we can hear the high frequencies in the feedback, and with low amounts, we can hear this filtered out. The same for the low cut filter. This allows us to cut out any really low boomy sounds from the feedback if we're pitching down with the pitch shifter. So here the low cut filter will filter the feedback below any frequencies that we select here. With low amounts, we can hear the pitch shifter bass frequencies in the feedback. But if I increase this, we may not be able to hear these. By the way, we can just have the feedback section enabled and not the reverb section if we wish. This can sound a little unnatural, but it may be interesting for sound effects or sound design purposes if you want to get away from the standard reverb effect but generally I would use the feedback section with the reverb section. Okay, so next we have the delay dial. For this example, let's use the snare sound again. So let's close this reverb, select the snare in the mixer and also the channel rack, and open up Luxverb. So this is the delay that's applied to the output before it's fed back into the loop. So it's basically the time between the sound and the feedback. We can set this in milliseconds, or we can enable this T button here, which allows us to use musical beat divisions that are synced to our project's tempo. It's the same setting really that we looked at for a pre-delay in the reverb section video. Let's set this feedback delay to 16, so it'll take 16 steps or four beats or one bar before we hear the feedback. Let's now turn on the metronome and it's going to play a full bar or four beats or 16 steps before we hear the reverb feedback. So the snare will play, then after four beats the snare will play again and that's where we hear the reverb feedback. So here. Let's just change this to 8, 
So now it will take eight steps or two beats or half a bar before we hear the feedback. So the snare will play, then the beat free here, we'll hear the feedback. So it can sound a bit messy if you use too much of this reverb feedback, so I do recommend using this feedback sparingly, or the sound can get a bit out of control. So I'm just going to pull back the gain dial now. As I said, we can also have the feedback delay time in milliseconds if we wish, if we deselect T. Again, let's put this back to default, and have a look at the last setting in this feedback section, which is Reverb Mix. This allows us to mix the wet reverberated and dry non-reverberated feedback into the loop. So the more we increase this, the smoother the signal will become over time as the feedback keeps going through the reverb. So with higher settings, it should sound smoother than lower settings. Okay, so that is the feedback section. This is actually a really interesting section of the reverb as it allows you to create some interesting sound design effects with this feedback section. So the reverb section we looked at before allows us to design the emulated space and the feedback section is more of a sound design tool. Okay, so that's the end of this video. Next, we're going to look at the output section. For now though, let's just turn off the feedback section and also the metronome before we look at the next section, which is the output section. Now let's have a look at the output section. Okay, so in the output section, we have these output sliders. We have already looked at these, but these are basically volume controls for the dry, unreverberated signal and the wet, reverberated signal. For example, if we drag the wet all the way down, we can hear the instrument without any reverb applied. If we increase the wet signal and have the dry signal all the way down, we will just hear the reverberated signal. Also, if you want to have your reverb as a send effect, then you will need to put the dry down to 0%. So this might be useful if you want to have several instruments from different tracks in the mixer alter this reverb effect. You may wish to do this so the reverb sounds more consistent as the instruments will be using the same reverb effect so it sounds like it's in the same room. It will also save on CPU or computer power as you'll just need one of these reverb effects rather than several. So if you have any dry signal on this effect, and you're using it as a send effect, what will happen is you will send your track to this effect and it will add the dry signal too, which will basically make your track louder as well as adding reverb. So for a send effect, make sure dry is all the way down to 0%. I'll show you quickly now how to set this up as a send effect, just in case you're new to doing this in FL Studio. So we first of all need to set up a send track, which will basically take a copy of the signal and send it to another track in the mixer. Time-based effects such as reverb and delay can be useful to add to a send track. Okay, so let's create a send track now. Before we do this though, I'm just going to remove the reverb for the strings and piano, so on track five and track six. That's because I'll be using a reverb send for these tracks instead. So I'm going to delete the Luxverb plugin for each of these tracks. So select the track in the mixer, and go over to Luxverb, click on the small arrow, and go to delete. Okay, now let's select both of these tracks where we just removed the reverb, and then we're going to set up the send track. So let's select both of these. We can select multiple tracks in the mixer by pressing Control and Shift on Windows, or Command and Shift on Mac. Let's now find an available track in the mixer where we're going to set up as a send track. For this, I'll choose track 15, and now let's right click on the arrow button down here, and select Route to this track. Now the audio from these tracks will go to the master track, and it will also send a duplicate to track 15, and we can see this via the cable here. So this is the same for track six and track five. Okay, so now let's select track 15, which is our send track, and select an empty effect slot and choose Luxverb. Let's now drag down the dry slider in the output section, as we will be adding more dry signal. Then I'll leave the rest on the default setting and close this reverb. If we click on track five and track six, You'll notice we can see this dial on track 15, and this allows us to control how much we send to the send track via this dial. So let's say, for example, we want to send more of the track for the strings than the piano. That way we can hear more of the reverb for the strings than the piano. So we can do this by selecting the piano track in the mixer, which is track six, 
and then turning this dial down so we send less of this track to the reverb. Then in track 5, which is the strings, we can turn up this dial. Let's hear this back now if I select the strings in a channel rack, which is track 5, and play some notes. You'll notice we can hear the reverb. That's because the duplicate of track 5 is getting sent to track 15, which has the reverb effect, but only the wet amount. Now let's hear the piano part. And you should be able to hear there, we can hear less of the reverb. Like any other track in the mixer, we can turn this send track up or down by adjusting the gain slider in the mixer. So you can hear when I put this all the way down, we cannot hear the reverb. And when I increase this, we can hear the reverb. I actually like to move the send track to the right of the mixer, so I know that all of the send tracks are on the right of the mixer. You can do this by finding an available space in the send track and right clicking, and then select dock 2, and then select right. Now you notice that when we scroll to the left and right of the mixer, we can still see the send track here on the right. So this can be useful, so you can always see your send tracks. We can also rename and colour the send track too, just to keep organised. So I'm going to right click on the send track and go to rename, colour and icon. For this I'm going to call it reverb and give it a colour. Now we know instantly that this is a reverb send track. We can also add more effects to the send track too if we wish. So just for this example, let's say we wanted to cut out some of the lows of the reverb, we could do this by adding an EQ. So we can click on the effects slot below the Lux Verb effect and choose Fruity Parametric EQ2. Just for this example, let's now cut out some of the low frequencies. Now if I play this back, you should be able to hear it's cut out some of the low frequencies of the reverb. We can also create boosts as well if we wish. I'm just going to sweep this now so we can clearly hear it. As the strings and piano part are both getting sent to the same reverb, if I select the string part, we can hear that this also has the boost and cut. As the string part is sharing the same reverb, we can also hear the EQ changes for the reverberated sound for the string part. So this doesn't have to be EQ, you could add distortion or compression, or really whatever effect you want to add to the reverb. You couldn't do this if you loaded the reverb on the instrument, as additional plugins would affect the instrument's actual sound and not just the sound of the reverb. So I just wanted to mention this as using a reverb as a send effect can be very useful. Now let's close this EQ effect and let's actually disable this EQ effect by pressing the small green button down here so we can't see this light, which means it's disabled. Okay, so that's the dry and wet gain sliders in Luxverb and that's also how you can set up a send track and effect sends in FL Studio. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one where we're going to continue looking at the output section. Okay, so now let's have a look at these four dials here in the output section. Peak frequency, peak gain, peak Q and width. These first three dials work together with each other. It's a little hard to explain but these are kind of like the resonance that you might get on a filter for a synthesizer. Let me show you now. So I'm going to play the string sound and then I'm going to increase the peak gain and you'll notice that when I move the peak frequency dial you should be able to hear a sound which is similar to a resonance control that you might find on the synthesizer. So let's now increase the peak gain, and then play a chord and adjust this peak frequency dial. So the peak frequency is what frequency we wish to increase, and the gain is by how much. Then we have the Q control, and this is the bandwidth so we can have a wider peak or a narrower peak. If we move this to the right, we will have a narrow Q, and if we move it to the left, we will have a wide Q. It's just like the notches you see on EQs. I'll just open up Fruity Parametric EQ2 again, so you can see what I mean by the Q. So for this example, let's look at notch 4 in the EQ. On the right here, we have this slider, and this is the gain control, so with this, we can boost or attenuate this notch. Then the dial below this allows us to adjust our frequency, so we can choose where in the frequency spectrum we want to adjust. To the right it's higher frequencies, and to the left it's lower frequencies. And then the dial below is the bandwidth or Q control. In this case, if we move the dial to the right we have a wider Q, and if we move it to the left we have a tighter Q. 
so the queue allows us to widen or tighten the area that we wish to adjust. Let me just close this EQ now and go back to LuxVerb. The queue control in LuxVerb is actually opposite to what it is in the Fruity Parametric EQ2. So as I said, in LuxVerb we get a tighter queue if we move to the right, and we get a wider queue if we move to the left. This may be a little difficult to hear, but let me show you now. But for now, let's put this peak cue control back to default. One thing you could do is perhaps automate this peak frequency dial here, which might be quite interesting if you want to create a sweeping acidy sound. Let me show you now. But now let's put peak frequency and peak gain back to default. Okay, so now let's have a look at this width dial here. By default, this will be at 1.2. So if we increase this, then this will widen the stereo image of the reverb. However, if we have this set at zero, then this will give us a mono wet signal. So mono will send the same signal to the left and right speaker. So even though we hear the sound through a pair of monitors or headphones, the sound coming out the left and right speaker will be the same. And stereo will send two unique signals to the left and right speaker. So mono might give us a tighter, more centered sound, and stereo might give you a wider, more spacious sound. Let me show you now with the string sound. So with this setting, it will make the reverb a mono sound. If we put this to default, then it will give us a stereo sound. So if it's on zero or mono, then this might give your reverb a more tighter centered sound. And if we increase this, it might give your reverb a wider, more spacious sound. Let me show you now. But again, let's put this back to default. This is a little hard to hear, but it will basically give your reverb a tighter sound if you move this control to the left, or a wider sound if you move it to the right. Remember this only affects the reverb, not the dry signal. Okay, so that's the end of this video where we've had a look at these three peak controls and the width control. Next, we're going to have a look at the envelope section down here. Okay, so now let's have a look at this envelope section. This is an interesting feature that's built into this plugin. Let's first talk about these three modes here, off, wet, and decay. I'll demonstrate this now on the piano sound. So let's select the piano in the channel rack. So for the default preset that we've been using, off is what it's been set to and off will be off. Then we have wet and decay. If we switch this over to wet mode, here we will have an envelope follower and this can be assigned to the wet level of the reverb. So the slider here in the output section. If we switch this to the decay mode, then it will modulate the decay level of the reverb. So the decay dial over here in the reverb section. So when we have either wet or decay selected, you'll notice that we have these lines appear in the graph display. Let me just play some notes on my MIDI keyboard and now you should see these lines. The blue line here represents the envelope. So when I play the piano sound loud, you should see there is a larger envelope than when I play the piano quieter. We can also set the threshold with this dial here, and the orange line represents the threshold. So the threshold is in decibels, and the level above this means that the envelope can cause the modulation. For this example, let's move this wet level to minus 35 dB, and let's move the threshold to around minus 35 dB. Also, if the scale dial is at zero, then there won't be any modulation, but if we increase this, then we should hear some of this modulation. Let's increase this to the maximum amount of plus one, so we can clearly hear this. So when the signal is loud, there should be more reverb than when the signal is quieter. So let's now hear this back, and you should be able to hear that the envelope will modulate the wet level. Okay, so you should have heard there that when the signal was loud, there was more reverb than when the signal was quieter. That's because it was modulating the wet dial based on the amplitude of the signal that's above the threshold. So positive values for the scale control will increase or accentuate the reverb's wet dial according to the input envelope. So when the signal is loud enough, there will be more reverb, 
and when the signal is quiet, there will be less reverb. But if we use negative amounts on this scale dial, then it will duck or decrease the reverb's wet dial according to the input's envelope. OK, let's now switch this over to Decay and have a look at this in the Decay mode. This allows us to modulate the decay based on the envelope. you notice now we have this red decay line on the graph, where previously we had the yellow wet line. So for this example, let's increase the wet amount to minus 3 dB. And let's put the decay to around 3 seconds. And let's adjust the threshold to around minus 40. And let's keep the scale dial on plus 1. So again, the signal needs to be above the threshold for this to take effect. And also, if the scale is at 0, then this won't take effect. Just like the wet setting, if we use negative values for the scale dial, then it will do the opposite. So it will decrease or duck the decay dial according to the input envelope. OK, so let's now hear this example, so you should be able to hear and also see on the graph that the louder sounds will have more decay than the quieter sounds. For this example as well, I'm going to put the offset at zero, and you can see when I do this, the decay dial drops down. This offset dial allows us to offset the modulation in one direction or the other. If we have this set to zero, then the modulation will be monopolar. If it's higher than zero, then the modulation will be bipolar. So with this, we can set the values to go up or down. But for this decay example, let's leave it on zero. So now you notice when I play this back, the louder sounds will have more decay than the quieter sounds. Again, the signal needs to be above the threshold for this to take effect. Also, if the scale is at zero, then this won't take effect. Just like the wet setting, if we select negative values for the scale, then it will do the opposite. So for this example, let's put the scale down to minus one. And I'm also going to adjust the offset. Now when I play quietly, you'll notice there's more decay than when I play loud. But again, I'm going to put offset back to default and also put scale back to plus one. We also have this low cut dial here and this allows us to add a low cut filter to the signal that's used to generate the envelope. This is in Hertz and with this, you can cut out some of the low frequencies of the signal. So I'm going to play a low note now and you should notice it's above the threshold and will modulate the decay dial. But when I increase this dial, it will filter out the low note and will not modulate the decay dial. And we should be able to see this in the graph. But again, let's go back to default. OK, we also have these attack and decay controls down here, and these allow us to adjust the attack and decay time in milliseconds. So with these controls, we can shape the attack and decay for this envelope. For this example, let's go back to the wet setting, and I'm just going to change the threshold to around minus 35, and I'll change the wet dial to minus 35. So we can increase this attack dial to smoothen out the attack, and let's also put the offset back to minus 50. So you notice that when I increase this attack dial, it will smoothen out this attack. And with this decay dial, we can increase the decay time or make it shorter. Again, let's put this back to default. We can also smoothen out our envelope with the smooth control. This smooth control will smooth out both the attack and the decay. Also by default we have this spectrum analyzer enabled and we can enable or disable this with this button here. I do recommend leaving this on as this can help us visually analyze what's going on. You also can enable the peaks too if you wish. So when peaks is enabled, you'll notice it will highlight the peaks in that envelope. However, I'm just going to put this back to default and disable peaks, but I'm going to leave spectrum enabled. Okay, so that is the end of this video where we've had a look at the envelope section. Next, we're going to have a look at the sidechain feature. 
So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so now let's have a look at this sidechain feature, which we can turn on and off with this button here. This allows us to sidechain the wet or decay envelope modes that we looked at previously. So if we have this set up, then we can duck the decay or reverb wet amount when the kick plays, for example. This may allow us to make more space in the mix, or we can use it as a creative effect. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to add four kick drums, each on every beat. Let's just do this on the default patch in the channel rack. I'm just going to add a new pattern, for this example I'll call it sidechain, and then I'm going to add a kick on every beat. I'm also going to paste this new pattern into the playlist. I'm also going to add a new pattern now, which will be a bass part. So let's add a new pattern, and I'm going to call this bass. Now I'm going to add a new instrument to the channel rack, for this I'm going to choose flex. And I'm going to choose a preset from mobile tuned 808 bass. I'm going to choose this one here called 808 kicked. So to demonstrate this I'm going to add a bass part, and then I'll apply the sidechain effect to this bass part. Ok let's now paste this bass part into the playlist. And I'm just going to click on this clip, and just add in a simple part. And I'm just going to draw in one held note. By the way you can use this sidechain with another instrument, it doesn't have to be the same as what I've set up here. Ok so let's go back to the pattern for the kick drum, and we can see here that the kick is getting sent to channel 1. So let's go to the mixer, and let's just rename and colour this, which I can do by right clicking on channel 1 in the mixer, and I'm just going to call this kick and give it a colour. We can see here that the kick is getting sent to channel 1. Let's now send the bass to its own track in the mixer, Let's choose the next available track, which is track 7. Again, just so we can quickly see these tracks, let me just right click and go and rename colour an icon and call this bass. And I'll give it a colour. Ok, so now what I'm going to do is make sure the kick isn't getting sent to the master channel, I want it to be sent only to the reverb channel. So previously we did set up this reverb send, now I'm going to make sure this kick gets sent only to the reverb and not to this master channel. So we can do this by selecting a kick track, and then go over to the reverb send, and then right click on this arrow button here, and select root to this track only. Now we can see the kick drum is not getting sent to the master channel, it's only getting sent to the reverb send effect. Now we need to make sure the send dial is turned all the way down, and now let's open up Luxverb that we have on this send track. Now in Luxverb, make sure sidechain is enabled, and now let's right click on this, and here you can see it says kick, which is a kick track that I created. Now when I play this back, we can see the kick drum in the envelope. So this is now what will trigger the envelope. Ok, so now let's actually send the bass track to the send track. So we can do this by selecting the bass track, and then right clicking on the arrow button on the reverb send track, and select root to this track. So now the bass will get sent to the master track, and the duplicate will get sent to the send track, which will just be the reverb for this track. With this dial here, we can choose how much we send to the reverb effect. For this example, let's just send the most so we can clearly hear this back. Ok, so now let's play this back, and let's actually switch this over to song mode, so we can see the kick drum and the bass play at the same time. We can make this effect less extreme if we turn down the scale dial here. We can also choose negative amounts with the scale dial if we want to duck the reverb when the kick plays. This might be more suitable if you want less reverb when the kick plays, but it does depend on what you want your part to do. For example, if it's for a creative effect, you may wish to have it set differently. But let me now quickly show you how to set this up. Let's just bring the scale all the way back to minus 1, and let's now increase the offset to plus 50. And I'm also going to increase the wet dial here. Now you notice when I play this back, there's less reverb when the kick plays. We can also see here in the envelope the reverb amount ducks down when the kick plays. And we can use this for decay as well as wet. So now the side chain will be affecting this decay dial. Remember, we won't be able to hear this sidechain effect if the envelope is set to off, it will only work with wet or decay. 
Okay, so that's the sidechain feature for this LuxVerb effect. Let me just swap this back to wet and talk about one more thing, which is the meter on the bottom right of our plugin. And this will show us our output level. I do recommend making sure this doesn't exceed 0 dB, or it may cause your track to clip, which you don't want. So if this is getting too loud, you can turn down the reverb with wet, or if this isn't set up as a send effect, you can turn down the dry here as well. So I recommend making sure this doesn't exceed 0 dB, or it may cause your track to clip, which you don't want. So if you do need to change the level of this instrument, you can turn down the wet amount and dry amount in the output section. So I do recommend testing out LuxVerb, as it really is a great reverb that offers you cool sound design possibilities. Okay, so we're now at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you found it useful. This video is actually a section taken from our complete FL Studio course. If you want to learn even more about FL Studio, then be sure to check out this complete course, where we cover many more aspects of music production in FL Studio. You can access this course via the link in the description below. So thanks again for watching, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one.